Here we are on the banks of the mighty Fraser River in beautiful British Columbia. Today we are going to talk about God's work in our lives and the work that we as Christians must do in this world. But before we do that, I'm going to ask Andrew to lead us in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you that you are always at work in our lives. We have the assurance of this every day simply by the feeling of our beating hearts because it is in you that everything lives and moves and has its being. The Apostle Paul wrote in Philippians 2.13 that you are constantly at work in us, giving us the desire and the power to do what pleases you. Thank you for your work in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Christianity isn't just something that we put on when we go to church and then set on the shelf until the next weekend. It's really a way of thinking and feeling about God, about others, and about ourselves. This is how it works. We start feeling good about ourselves when we realize that God loves us and forgives us for all the bad things that we've done. This leads to a deep love and appreciation for the God who loved us enough to send Jesus to rescue us. As we study the Bible, we realize that God doesn't just love us, but He loves everyone else as well, and He wants us to love them too. Jesus says in John 15, 12, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. We then begin looking for ways to help others realize that they're also loved by God, because we know that a relationship with God is the best thing that could ever happen to them. Eventually, this desire to introduce others to the God we love becomes our main focus, and we begin to view this as the real purpose of our lives.
In 1 Corinthians 13, Paul says, Though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains and have not love, I am nothing. You know, we need to love one another like Jesus loves us. I long to have much more of that love so that I can better do the work that Jesus wants me to do. One of the ways in which the Bible says that God shows his love to us is through the ministry of angels. He sends angels down to this world. Sometimes people have entertained angels and they look like human beings. They were dressed like common men, but they were really angels. And so if God is constantly sending angels to minister to us, and that's their work, then I'm wondering, have any of you ever seen an angel? I know that's a personal question. It's kind of private too. But is anyone courageous enough, brave enough, to share maybe a time when you thought and you consider that this was a work of an angel in your life? Well, you know, I've never actually seen an angel that I know of, but I can tell you about an experience with my dad when he was a missionary in Africa. He was traveling from Johannesburg to Zambia, and he had to go through the country of Zimbabwe. And this was a very dangerous country to be going through. They had a lot of civil unrest, and they were just about to gain their independence. So this was a dangerous country to be going through. And he was trying to catch up with a convoy that would take him through the country safely with armored vehicles all around and everything. And so he got to the border, but the convoy had already left without him. And he made the decision to go on ahead into the country and try to catch up with them. And so he started out onto the road and it got darker and darker. And about 11 o'clock at night, his car just sputtered and stopped. And so he rolled off to the side of the road and looked under the hood. And there was fuel in the carburetor and there seemed to be spark. And he couldn't figure out what the problem was. And he thought, well, I don't know why the car stopped, but I'll try starting it again. And so he did and started up fine. And he thought, well, that was weird. And so he kept on going down the road. And about an hour later, the same thing happened. The car just sputtered and stopped once again. And so he got out and he looked under the hood and everything looked okay. And he thought, this is really strange that the car's not working. And he thought, you know, I don't know what to do. And this is, this is not good because I'm out here in Zimbabwe and several people have been killed recently in this area by the insurgents. And so he just sent up a prayer and said, Lord, you know all about this car and you know all about my situation. And I ask you to please send some help right now. Mm -hmm. Amen. And within a few minutes, a car pulled up, a BMW, and pulled up right in front of him and shone its headlights on the hood. Mm -hmm. And this man got out and he said, could I help you with anything? He said, it looks like you're having trouble. And he started poking around there in the engine and he said, you know, I think your coil's bad. Mm -hmm. And my dad said, well, that's nice, but where are we going to get a coil this time of night in the middle of nowhere? <laughs> and the man said, well, I think I have one in, in the trunk of my car. He just happened to have a coil in the trunk of his car for yeah. his car. Yeah, for his car. <laughs> yeah. and, and my dad's car was a different kind of car. Different than, kind of car. It wasn't a BMW. Yeah. And so my dad said, well, that's interesting. <laughs> well, let's put it in. So the man went and got the coil and they installed it. And they started the car and it started right up. And so my dad said, well, thank you so much. What could I ever do to thank you? The man said, there's nothing, you know, it's okay. It was just enough for me to help you. And so my dad gave him a couple apples and he said, why don't you pull out and the man said no no you go ahead I want to make sure you're out on the road and that you're safe and so my dad just pulled out onto the road and he turned to wave to the guy and there was no car there nobody there no one wow. there was no man no car and my dad kind of looked around and said wow well, God answered my prayer yeah yeah he sent an angel to help me that's what I would consider to be an angel um, someone who came out of nowhere and helped your dad with mm -hmm. a situation that's just unexplainable. Thanks for sharing that. 
I find it interesting how most of us consider it a sacrifice to live for the good of others. But what many don't realize is that when we bless others, we gain a bigger blessing ourselves. You've probably heard the words of Christ where he says, it is better to give than to receive. This simple saying describes why heaven is such a wonderful place to be. You see, the spirit of unselfishness doesn't just make the world go round. It makes the whole universe go round. In fact, this attitude of counting others better than yourself is at the foundation of the Ten Commandments. And it's by living in harmony with the principle of love that we find happiness and meaning in life. And by living for others, I am preparing myself to live in the atmosphere of that perfect place called heaven. Do not wait until some deed of greatness you may do. Do not wait to shed your light afar. To the many duties ever near you now be true. Right in the corner where you are. Right in the corner. Just above our clouded skies that you may help to clear, let not narrow self your way divide. Though into one heart alone may flow your song of cheer, right in the corner where you are, right in the corner. Right in the corner where we are, the effort to bless others reacts in blessing upon ourselves. So when we bless others, we're actually blessing ourselves. In fact, you can never lose in doing the work of God. You know, God could have committed all the work of the gospel to the heavenly angels, but He chose to include us in this work. In 1 John 4 verse 7, it says, Beloved, let us love one another, because love is of God and everyone who loves is born of God. So I have a question for you. If love is from God, have you met someone, a real person, we can talk theoretically about love, but to actually see love in action, have you ever met someone who has shown the real love of God in their lives? Yes. Whenever my siblings and I look for a role model in our lives, we always think of our father. But this was not always the case. Mm -hmm. When we were children, our father was constantly on business trips. We had a nice house. We had everything we could want, but our dad. Mm. Then he got a divorce and everything changed after that. We lost the house, we lost the neighborhood. We couldn't afford all those things anymore, but that is when, my siblings and I, that is when we truly start to feel happy. Mm. It is when he had the divorce that he could realize he could lose the people that was closest to him. That was when he decided he was going to be the best father he could be, to try and regain the time he lost. Mm. 
it was at that point that we truly gained a father. Mm. And he started to teach us things that he wanted us to learn that he was never able to do before. And he taught us by example. We were constantly driving around and whenever he would see a homeless person, he would just pull off to the side of the road and he would help them. And this had such a strong impact on me that as we were leaving a restaurant one day, I saw this old woman in filthy rags, this homeless person. I just reached into my pocket and pulled out a $10 bill and just walked over and said, here. Wow. So you saw your father doing this and now you wanted to do that to help others. Mm -hmm. What my father did, I wanted to do. Mm. I wanted to be just like my dad. Mm. And then when I gave this ten dollars to this woman, with just tears streaming down her face, she looks into my eyes and says, Thank you. I'll keep you in my prayers. Mm. Thank you for the kindness you've shown me today. Mm. Then we all got the horrible news. Our father had been diagnosed with leukemia. We didn't know how much longer he had to live. He didn't know how much longer he had to live. But he knew he had to work twice as hard to help us. He started redoubling his efforts in order to teach us the things he wanted us to know. And then there was this one amazing experience of when he was with one of his own girlfriends, he was praying. And then just as they were praying, all of a sudden she looks at him and just, just this like look of shock and awe is on her. And then he stops praying, looks over at her and she's just, she can't say anything. She's just staring at him. Mm. And then he says, what, what is it? And she says, you, you're surrounded by a holy light. Mm. And then another time when he was at the hospital receiving his chemotherapy treatments, he was laying on the bed and this nurse came in and just dropped everything, just looked at him and had that same look on her face. Mm. And then my father looked at her and she said, you have a holy light about you. Mm. He later found out that a friend had gone in front of a church and asked for the whole congregation to join together in prayer. So at that moment they were praying for him. At that very hour they were praying for him. Mm. And then as this light was around him, he just felt this inner peace that God was with him. And even when he was in the hospital, even when he could barely lift his head, he still wanted to help. And he came up and he was always trying to be the best patient for the nurses. And this had such a profound impact on him that they all got together, got their money together and bought a golden angel praying. Mm. Then the day came and it was the funeral. My siblings and I, we were taking it very hard. We had lost someone very dear to us. Mm. And then we walked into this church. This church is huge. This church has two stories. There's the main aisle in front and then there's two on the side and then there's two above it. Mm. And we walk in, and then just hordes of people start walking into the church. Mm. The whole front area is filled, both sides are filled, and people had to start streaming in to get on the top. And then my pastor, the pastor of the church, he never really got to know my father. Mm -hmm. But he came up to my mom and said, who was this man? Because mm. your father was always in the hospital. Yeah. And so he actually didn't get a chance to meet him properly. Yeah. He never really got to know the pastor. He was so sick, he was not able to get up out of bed sometimes to go to church. Mm -hmm. But when my pastor saw just how many people this man's life had touched, mm. he was just filled with amazement. Mm. And he looks and he says to my mom, I've never seen so many people at a funeral before. Mm. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Every single one of those lives he had touched. Mm. So your father's life was changed when he realized 
that he he couldn't always guarantee that people were going to be around him. And so he changed from being all centered on work to being on relationships. But then he gets this terrible news that he has leukemia. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't cause him to stop loving people. In fact, he continues loving them even more. And mm -hmm. it influences so many people's lives. It had created such a profound impact on our community mm -hmm. that even weeks, months after the funeral, even years after the funeral, mm -hmm. we would still walk into the familiar places where our dad would take us. Mm -hmm. And we would, of course, order the things that we used to order and, you know, get the things that, like, our father would like to get. Mm -hmm. And then the people behind the counter would just look at us and be like, you look just like your dad. Mm -hmm. The, the, I mean, you look just like the person that used to come here. So you resemble your dad and your features. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they would look at us and be like, there's a guy that used to come here. He was so kind to us. And then oh. we would tell him the story of our dad and how he died. Mm. And then some of them would just tear streaming down their face and say, we're so sorry. He was such a nice man. Mm. Well, that, that perfectly shows the love of God in another person, that when that love is in your life, it's almost like the fragrance of a rose or a flower. It just pervades the atmosphere, and everyone around can pick up that fragrance, and it changes their lives too. Mm -hmm. Thanks for telling us that story, Luke, about your dad. Mm -hmm. Just what does it look like when someone lives to bless others? I mean, does everyone have to quit their jobs and become full-time gospel workers? The Bible gives many examples of godly people who did ordinary things in an extraordinary way. I think Jesus is the best example though because he spent 90% of his 30 years on earth working in a carpenter shop doing ordinary things just like you and I. But after the life of menial labor, God testified that this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. This was before he even started preaching. You see, Jesus was living a life of total unselfishness, even when working at a regular job, and this pleased God. Maybe you and I can do the same right where we are with the people that we rub shoulders with every day. When Jesus comes back to the earth to take his people home, I want to hear the words recorded in Matthew 25, 23. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. In the harvest field now And you 
In Matthew 25, 23, it says that when Jesus returns, he will turn to those who are faithful and been faithful in doing his work and say, well done, good and faithful servant. Can you imagine Jesus actually saying to you, well done, good and faithful servant, that those words are actually coming from his lips. That is motivation enough to want to do his work. You may be an evangelist or a minister, but you don't have to be. You can be a mechanic, a nurse, a teacher, or a housewife. If you are faithfully doing the work that God has called you to do, if others are convinced that you desire to do them well, then you are doing God's work in your life. You don't have to wait for extraordinary abilities. You don't have to wait for some great occasion to do God's work. You can do it right where you are. I think, though, that you need to turn to God in prayer and ask Him to strengthen you. So let's do that right now. Let's turn to Him in prayer and ask Him to strengthen us so that we can faithfully do His work and hear Him say to us, Well done, good and faithful servant. Heavenly Father, often we do not feel or even think that we are doing anything great, but we choose to go forward quietly, doing faithfully the work of sharing your love with others. Lord, you do not ask us to get stressed out about the success of the work, because this work is yours, Lord, and you are doing it through us. And so we commit ourselves to be your workers, knowing that together with you in this world, we are being fitted for the world to come. In Jesus' name we pray.